My goal is to save every broken VanMoof in the world. Because VanMoof won't really help you anymore. This cheap VanMoof was abused, broken and sold for parts, so I decided to save it. I've torn down the bike and came up with a possible way to convert and repair it, but since it was heavily damaged, I decided that it should get a new paint job as well. So after stripping it completely, I sanded all of the individual parts down and made them look incredible with a fresh coat of paint. Then came the most difficult part, which was reassembling it and routing all of the electronics, making custom parts and getting everything to work again. Finally, we're at the most fun part, which is getting it finished, complete, and then back on the road. So let's start with the first thing, and that's mounting this controller. As you might remember, my first attempt at printing a controller box didn't really work, so guess what? So I'm in a new one, and although they look pretty similar, uh, it's actually just a few degrees that makes all of the difference. So we need to get this one painted, uh, prepped, and then mounted on the bike. I made sure to do it right the second time. You know what they say, measure once and 3D print twice. Since this one does actually fit, I'm making it look pretty to match with everything else. And first up is sending it to get rid of those lines and then I'm cleaning it really well to get the paint to actually stick. After getting the prints completely prepped, I made sure to preheat them and the cans since it is a little cold outside. Then I could go out to paint them, but there's a slight issue. It's raining. So I'm going to continue on other parts and problems for now. So onto the next part. This right here is the headlight or well, part of the headlight. Uh, and I was trying to convert this just like I did on the rear light, uh, which worked perfect. But there's a small problem because when you put on the basket on this bike, the headlight is sort of in the middle of the basket or well, quite underneath there. Um, so you won't really see the headlight. And of course you would see the light shining on the ground, but I feel like in, in a cold and rainy, dark day, that's, that's horrible. So I don't know if Amov didn't think about it or that I just don't know about it or well, any solution. Um, but I figured that I'd make some extension tubes to fill up the space. So what I did is I made a tube to extend the front light. Uh, this is the first version, which didn't work very well. And this is the second version, which this little lens goes into there, uh, goes into here. And then the light will be all the way up here, which I think is a lot better. But are there any solutions out? Did I just not get all of the parts with this bike or I don't know? You let me know in the comments. This is a great time to tell you that if you like this sort of stuff, it would be great if you would subscribe to the channel. It's free and it helps me out a lot. Thanks. So these parts also need some light prepping, like sanding and cleaning before paint can be applied. First a coat of filler primer to smooth everything out and then a few coats of flat black paint. In between coats to let them dry inside and to be fair they came out really nice or at least I think so. I let every part harden above the heater and then it was time to finish the 3D printed parts. These little things are thread inserts and they can be used to, well, create threads. With something hot like a soldering iron or a little burner it's very easy to heat them up and melt them into the pet G. Printing your own parts at home and even creating threads in them makes it feel like there's really nothing that you cannot build or repair anymore. It is so amazing to see how easily accessible these techniques become to a lot of people and it's only going to get better from here. With the threads in, I can mount the new box on the bike with the same two M4 screws and since I wired everything in the previous video, I just need to make sure all of those wires fit inside the box. And finally, the headlight extension tube can go into place and I'm very happy that it has such a snug fit because this means that it doesn't rattle around all of the time and to be honest, I think that's quite a nice solution. So this LED with also the little speaker attached to it, I'm not really sure if I'm going to keep it because it's a really annoying buzzer and you, you probably just want to have a normal bell on the bike anyway. So, but that being said, it's there anyway, so might as well keep it. I'm not sure yet. So this LED can go into the 3D printed and now painted uh, case. And then on top of there can go the old lens that we carefully removed from the old light. And then all of that can go inside of the bike uh, and it should all be very nice and bright and then work really well instead of having the light underneath the basket. So uh, pretty pleased with that. To mount everything inside of the new parts, I just used some hot glue and there's no really big forces on the internals anyway, so I figured that this will be good enough. Of course, the reason for a new LED is the voltage increase and the original can handle 9 volts and my new one should be able to work with the 36 volts that the new controller now is supplying. The red wire is the positive for the buzzer and the green one is the positive for the light and of course that makes the black wire the one for the ground or negative. 
and the bike is really coming together right now so i'm i'm proper excited because i want to get this thing finished and in the previous video some people told me that they think i should be a bit more safe when soldering and you know they're probably right so uh, let's do that uh, of course if you want to express your feelings about the bike if you think it's as cool as i think it is uh, of course let me know and also uh, if you like this sort of stuff subscribe I thought about putting plugs and clips instead of soldering, but I think that will just increase the number of connections that can actually fill, and also they might just rattle around all of the time. The new light is very bright and that's perfect since I want every biker to be safe at night, and the first thing that helps with that is having a set of good working lights. Another safety issue is of course speed, and on my previous build I have been tempted to increase the top speed since the motor on these bikes can do a lot more than the original 25 km an hour. But to be fair, with these higher speeds you should also kind of wear a helmet and that's why I decided to limit all of these bikes to their original 25 km an hour. The fenders also need some reassembling after paint and luckily these are made with just some metal brackets, bolts and washers instead of those plastic clips that always like to break. In general these bikes are pretty well made and a lot of the parts are metal which are screwed into the frame and they are easy to adjust or replace if you ever need to. The motor cable is really easy to connect just in case you ever get a flat tire and after lining up the little two arrows it can just plug in and be protected through this little plastic shield. The motor cable likes to rub on the motor, but I have a trick for this, which is routing it on the outside of the fender support. And after that the front brake can also go on, but I'm not aligning this until after the wheels are completely secured, so for now of course the rear fender can also be mounted. And bit by bit the bike is really piecing together and I really like the contrast of the color, and if I'm completely honest, I might like this color more than my original green Van Moof. So before I can get around to fitting all of the final parts and also putting in the rear wheel for the final time, I'm having some slight issues with the kick lock and what I found is, well, let me show you. So before I put the kick lock inside of the bike, uh, of course I'd made sure that it worked and it worked just perfect. Then I put it in the bike and it stopped working. I took it out again, started working again, so this was pretty weird. And what I found is that when the two shells of the kick lock, let me get the other one, that when the two shells of the kick lock get pressed on each other really hard, that basically prevents the little slider pin from actually moving. And um, this is really weird and there's no other way to describe it probably than just a manufacturing defect because it's just too tight of a tolerance. So I found this little ridge that seems to be left over from casting the kick lock uh, housing. So I want to get rid of the ridge, smooth it out and then hopefully it should work even when it's tightened down in the bike uh, because this is really annoying. <laughs> I don't see how I could have possibly broke this kick lock or how this could be my mistake but then again it would also be pretty weird for it to come out of the factory broken so I don't know what happened here. Anyway I cleaned it a bit and then started removing some material with the Dremel and afterwards I used some finer sanding to smooth it out and the result is a kick lock with a bit more room inside. So this thing is just a little jigsaw puzzle and working on it and seeing how it was designed is pretty cool. And it also looks quite expensive to design and produce. With the bolts in, I could go ahead and test it. And finally it seems to actually work all of the time and I'm very happy with that result. Then it was time to mount it in the bike, but even after adjusting it a couple of times, it still didn't lock very smooth and I tried greasing it, but still it wouldn't really work like I thought that it should. After making some small adjustments to the frame itself, finally it had enough room to work smoothly and that meant that I could put the wheel back in, lower it down and also make sure that the wheels were fully seated in the frame. By doing this I can avoid readjusting the brake caliper every time that I need to remove a wheel. Because now the wheel will be in the same spot every time. Seems to work. All right. Of course the brakes still need to be wired up and to do that I need the inner cables. By reusing the rear one for the front brake and putting a new cable in for the rear brake I get to have two long enough cables for the price of one. I'm so glad that I'm past the stage of routing the outer cables with the electronic wires because that was so much work. The S models are so much easier but of course I already did one of those so I might as well be trying something new. Oh. 
With the inner cable wired up to the caliper, I can start adjusting everything because these are mechanical brakes and that means that they're not that difficult to adjust, but of course you just need to try it a couple of times and get the hang of it. These disc brakes are not the greatest in the world, but then again the bike is fairly lightweight, so it's not too bad either. They have enough power if you just stay on top of the maintenance, but then again that goes for a lot of stuff. The front brake also needs to be wired up, adjusted and then connected, but that's just a repeat of the rear brake, so nothing special there. I realized that I didn't put any copper grease on the kickstand bolt and since I don't want it to get rusted stuck in the future, I might as well just fix that now. Then it was time to mount the chain guard, tensioner and of course the drivetrain of the bike. And if I'm honest, I think this isn't the greatest part of this bike's design. It makes a lot of noise even when you adjust it, but then again, they do call it a chain glider, so it's normal to contact the chain, I guess. After tightening down the cranks, I could go ahead and fit the chain tensioner, and this needs to be somewhat aligned to be in line with the chain. This way it makes less noise, and also I think that those little tensioner wheels will last a bit longer. With the little speed link, the chain can be put back and pulled through the tensioner. And of course, I cleaned the chain guard and also some other bits before I put them back and completed the entire assembly of the drivetrain. Now it's time to do all of the finishing touches, like making sure that no cables are rubbing on my brand new paint, and also putting some frame protection on the parts that need it. Then I filled up the tires and started theft proofing the bike. So I got this uh, old second-hand lock of some old bike for free, which is pretty nice because might as well reuse some, uh, some of the parts. And some of the silver sides, I think I'm gonna paint them black to match the bike a bit better because I did that on my other Venmove as well. And I also got this chain for free, which I mean, it's used, but it still, it's, it still works pretty well. So might as well just reuse it and uh, have some fun with it. So I'm going to paint this and then also the seat post, seat post, because that has some scratches on it as well and I want to have it pretty nice and uh, even. So more flat black painting to do. All right. So here we go one last time painting the final parts. And painting a seat post is pretty weird because it will get scratched up really easy again. But I'm going to make sure to set it at the right height and then just leave it. While I waited for the paint to dry, I did some other things and then after the lock was cured, I screwed it to the frame with a couple of Allen key bolts. The seat post got put back in as well, without any scratches this time, and that is basically it. Alright, so the bike is now, well, I would say almost done and it looks really good, so I'm really happy with it. Uh, the final step is to polish up a few bits because there are a few little bits and pieces on the bike that are not really perfect yet. And I'm not trying to go for perfect, but I'm trying to go for like really nice. So I'm just shining up some last bits, then putting some car wax on top of it because I just have this stuff laying around anyway. Uh, make it look all pretty and perfect. And, and then with that, the bike should basically be done. All right, so next to polishing, there are a few bits and pieces on the bike where the clear coat is pretty bumpy, like this section over here. I don't know if you can actually see it, um, but what I'll be using is just some water and some really fine sandpaper, sand smooth the clear coat, and then polish it to, yeah, just make it really nice. Of course, all of the painting, sanding and the polishing has nothing to do with actually converting it, but doesn't it look really cool? I think the subtle metallic flake on this green or greyish paint came out really nice and it looks even better after polishing and waxing. After this, I got to go on my first test drive, which was a lot of fun. So it's finished, or well, sort of. So the bike drives really well and I'm really happy with the results and it looks amazing of course, but there's a slight problem because every now and then it seems to not respond quite well to the pedal assist sensor. 
and I actually had to tear my other VMOV down to find the problem, but luckily I did. So I have a new pedal assist sensor or bottom bracket because they're integrated. So I have a new one on order, but that won't arrive until probably after Christmas or something. So uh, that will be for another time. But of course, for now, it's pretty much done other than that slight problem. Anyway, I really hope that you have enjoyed this series or watching it. And if you did, be sure to give a like and a subscribe to the channel. It doesn't cost anything and it helps me out a lot. I'm actually trying to reach that 3000 subscribers before the end of this year. And I know that's not a very big number, but to me it is. So it would be great if you could help me out. Also, of course, as always, drop your thoughts and comments down below in the comment section, because I really want to know if you think this bike is just as cool as I think it is. <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one. And and then there's really not much for me left to say except thank you so much for watching have a great holidays and christmas and i hope to see you next time